Good Mental Health, a regular podcast series that helps you make sense of the world around you in order to lead a more optimal life. We do that by examining the teachings of Dr. Neil Marinello. He's a behavior expert and solutions focused life coach in Woodstock, Vermont, with near six decades exploring the human condition. He's been tweeting for a number of years now, and uh, we examine uh, his tweets in this podcast series. And as always, I'm pleased to be joined by the good doctor. Neil, it's always a pleasure seeing you on the show here. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure also, Matt. Our topic uh, for today is just such a natural progression from uh, where we began this podcast series. And if you recall, uh, to the viewer out there, we began with the 10 rules for life, if you will, uh, sort of a, a basis for uh, the reality around you. Um, and we've now morphed into a, a sort of a second chapter, if you will, of The Good Doctor's Tweets, where we're really examining where perception informs thinking, which determines reality. Um, perception, thinking, and reality. That's sort of the second uh, phase here that we've been speaking with. And our topic today is really a natural progression, again, of where we began this second part of the series, which was what I see is not what's there. There's what's real, what's not real, and what we perceive to be real. And then today's topic is really, again, about meaning. And the meaning anything has is what you give it. And Neil, this is really just, again, another way of uh, saying that how we significate anything determines its impact in our lives. Isn't that correct? Uh, yes, yes. I think that the, uh, uh, the thing which started me thinking in this direction uh, was a, uh, uh, a scene from uh, the movie Oh God, in which uh, George Burns is playing God, and uh, uh, he's being tested as to whether he really is God or not. And the question that is asked uh, is, what is the meaning of life? Mm. And the answer that is given is uh, the meaning of life is exactly and precisely what you think it is, no more, no less. And uh, I began to, to do a riff on that and understood that, the, that we give meaning to things based on our own projections, based on what comes from within us. And uh, I started thinking in terms of the interactions that I have with people as uh, my reaction to what they say and their reaction to what I say, which may or may not uh, be in concert. Uh, so I remember many years ago, uh, uh, we were doing uh, uh, the evaluation of, uh, of kids coming into kindergarten. And we were using a thing called the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test, in which it gave an age-related uh, score to uh, what a child, uh, how the child answered the questions. and. Uh, one child uh, answered questions at a 10-year-old level, and that child was five years old, which by the old method of de determining IQ, which was uh, uh, mental age over chronological age times 100, would have given him a 200 IQ, uh, which is quite extraordinary. And uh, I was quite embarrassed uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to hear the reaction of the teacher when I showed it to her. I was excited, obviously, and I showed the, the results. And she said, uh, oh, don't worry about it, Neil. We'll have him down to normal in no time. <laughs> oh, goodness. Hmm. And, uh, and I realized that not only had she misunderstood what I was saying, but, uh, but she had interpreted my excitement uh, as if it was some sort of a, uh, uh, of a major concern about something wrong with the child. Uh, and uh, there have been several examples of that that I've had since then, of people who uh, choose the interaction uh, to significate, to give meaning to what I'm saying that isn't exactly what I meant to say, and my possibly doing the same thing with what they're saying. So uh, the, the giving of meaning to something comes from within each of us, and we have to check it out to make sure that we're doing it the right way. Well, and I, I love that you started the the answer with that uh, analogy of, you know, the Oh God movie. And, and in a sense, that's the natural progression, if you will, of this question is what is the meaning of life? 
And, and it really is just that, that it, and it, it isn't anything more than that. And, and I mean that by saying that the meaning of life is what you give it. And, and that's it. You know, we can yeah, even go yeah. deeper and deeper and deeper, but that's but, not what right. we're talking about here. It's like, it's a very, very simple concept. The meaning of life is what you make it. And that has to do with the key to uh, happiness. Mm. The key to being happy actually has a great deal to do with the way you think about things. And the way you think about things is a variable. It's something that can be changed. It can be changed by interacting with somebody else. It can be changed by interacting with parts of yourself. It can be changed by figuring out how to get your conscious and your subconscious to communicate better. Uh, so the truth is that, uh, that happiness is directly related to how we significate the experiences we've had, the experiences we're having right now, and the ways in which we anticipate future experiences. And, and so this is just beautiful because it so dovetails with sort of what's been going on for me in that, you know, for probably the past week, I haven't been feeling great, you know, um, and, and I'm very aware of the connection between mind and body. And so I have to be very careful not to talk myself into illness, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because I know sure. of that power and things like that. Um, and so it, it just, again, it's like, it's what I make of it. It's my interpretation and it has to be for my better health. Um, and, and, and so other things that have been happening in, since we last spoke, I sort of feel have been preparing me for today's discussion mm -hmm. in that I've come upon the Kabbalion, which is um, the hermetic teachings of Hermes, Trismegistrus, you know, which is um, supposed to be the in latest incarnation of Thoth, who is the ancient Egyptian uh, deity. Um, and things like that. And, and it, it's talking about all and, and, and it was sort of a written encapsulation of what you and I have been spending, you know, the last 14 weeks uh, sharing here. Um, and so it was, it was wonderful to get sort of that external influence as a form of confirmation about what we've been talking about. So it, it validated some of the things we've been talking about. Absolutely. Unfortunately, I'm not familiar with, uh, with what you're talking about though. I don't, uh, I'm aware of the Kabbalah. This I'm is different. Aware. This is not the Jewish, uh, you know, uh, text and, and uh, rituals. Yeah, this is the Kabbalion, K-Y-B-A-L-I-O-N. And uh, it was written in 1908. So it's, again, so interesting is that it confirms uh, what we've been talking about here in, you know, 2021, but was written over 100 years ago. Uh, and what you've just said, you're not aware of. Yes, yes. I mean, uh, some of what I'm, I'm saying comes from uh, uh, William James, who uh, uh, actually wrote in the 19th century about uh, uh, the importance of meaning and uh, and how we give meaning to things uh, and that that determines our happiness. Uh, and some of it has to do with, uh, uh, you know, later works uh, uh, of uh, uh, people who, who have been psychologists or have studied psychology. But when it comes to understanding physical stuff, what's going on with, you know, if I'm in pain in one kind or another, uh, there are a couple of ways of doing that, uh, and one of them was developed by a guy named uh, Adler uh, in the early 1900s, and uh, he had a question which uh, I have used many times, uh, and when a person reports some sort of a, a physical symptom, uh, he would say, uh, let's uh, he would do something like uh, take out a, a pen and say, okay, now, uh, uh, when you want to, uh, uh, to understand what's going on with you at this point, uh, take the pen and let's assume that the pen is somehow a magic wand. And uh, when you 
when you want to take the pen and tell me what your wish is that, that, you know, that comes to your mind when you take the pen. And then the client takes the pen. And, uh, and if the client says, uh, um, my stomach has been hurting, uh, but I, uh, uh, I, I wish my wife would be nicer to me, then it's probably got more of a psychological basis. Uh, if the uh, client says, uh, my stomach has been hurting and I wish the pain would go away, then it's probably more of a physical basis. Now, the way that I deal with, uh, with physical problems when I have them is to use a Fritz Perls technique, which is to actually, if, uh, if I'm feeling pain in my stomach, I become the stomach. And I say, okay, I'm the stomach, and uh, what am I trying to tell you? Uh -huh. and, uh, and then, uh, depending on what it says, I try to get inside the experience of the stomach and project uh, from the stomach to my conscious mind and figure out, uh, is there something I can do right now, uh, as we said before, that'll help you feel even a little bit better about it. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it's really interesting because, again, through the work that we've been doing in this series and, and of course, you know, uh, prior, uh, I'm pretty in touch with what I think I need or feel that I need. And I know what the answer is. It doesn't make that, it, that it's any easier to um, incorporate. Um, and that then also uh, could also be part of the source of the problem, you know, is the awareness that I feel that I'm not necessarily powerless, but that I'm not taking the power to implement uh, a solution that I know would be beneficial. Yeah, you'll have to be more specific. <laughs> well, uh, um, you know, so I do have tummy problems right now. And so I know that part of the problem is that I'm overeating or I'm eating poorly so that my diet needs to improve. But I'm sort of like, well, how do I do that? And and in a sense, it's uh, you, you throw up your hands. And, and, and I know that I'm not alone in this because I know you yourself. Uh, you know, have uh, issues with food, an, an example. But again, my awareness that this is part of my problem and my awareness that I'm not solving this issue could be, in fact, the gestational start of the discomfort. Does that make sense? Uh, yes and no. Uh, the part of it that, uh, that uh, and the, uh, the disclaimer here, uh, as I've said before, is that if I have an area that I'm still working on and uh, hopefully will resolve before I uh, reach the age of 90, I'm 77 now, uh, it is uh, with regard to food. Uh, I can give you some of the ways that I've dealt with it. Uh, one of them is that uh, to understand that uh, that what my stomach is telling me uh, is a desire for resolving problems which may or may not be uh, physical. And most of the time they are more emotional. Right. Uh, I'm a stress eater. Uh, uh, whenever I feel like, gee, I really want something to eat right now, uh, and it's especially something with sugar in it, uh, I assume that uh, I'm experiencing some form of anxiety, uh, that there's something I'm scared of thinking, and uh, what I'll often do is uh, say, okay, I'm going to answer the question, what am I scared to think right now before I, uh, I put something in my mouth? Uh, what I have come up with, I guess, is the, uh, the major way in which I resolve my weight issues. And I'm quite sure that if I didn't ask myself this question, I would weigh 400 pounds. Uh -huh. uh, it's uh, uh, wait five minutes and consider everything that I swallow. If I'm going to swallow something, think about it first and see if, in fact, it feels right to, to eat that, or is there something else I can do uh, that uh, might meet the need uh, that, uh, that the desire to swallow something is coming from? Well, and again, I just love that we're, we're able to have this discussion because it, it uh, vicariously allows me to process some of my own issues uh, as well and tr as trying to help the viewer out there. Um, and so I know that, 
you know, as we talk about, you know, my tummy and, and it's a diet issue, what it really is, is a loneliness issue and probably a fear of loneliness because I experience loneliness a lot, given that I'm single and I don't have a wide circle of friends to whom I can interact with on a daily basis, on a regular basis. So I know that what I need is an intellectual stimulation, but because I don't have a significant companion such as you have with your wife, Anne, that that, that touch is missing from my life. And I think we certainly know that, you know, the health benefits of physical touch uh, are, are profound. And so I know that the answer for me is I need to find a massage therapist again. And I'm okay. not doing that even though I know that intellectually that would be a solution. And yet for some reason, I'm not uh, taking that to the next level to act on it. What I can say is prior to uh, today's, you know, meeting, you know, half an hour, an hour beforehand, you know, as I get present to what our topic is and how it's impacting me, I went and looked online for a local massage therapist. I didn't find one uh, that I want to work with, but I certainly found a list. So yeah, that's a, that's a start. Yeah, there are several benefits to it. Once you get in, t once you get in touch with the fact that you need touch, uh, then the issue is uh, what you start starting with what you did, which is find a list. Don't be afraid to uh, to try out various ones. Uh, but the most important thing is uh, scheduling an appointment knowing that you're doing something about it. Uh, and uh, then you have the additional factor of anticipation when you feel lonely. And that of course is distinct from feeling alone because uh, uh, feeling alone uh, does not have associated with it uh, the uh, sadness and emptiness that you're connecting uh, by, uh, by significating it as lonely. Uh, the reality is that uh, and you can say to yourself, okay, well, I'm doing something about this. I've got an appointment with uh, so-and-so on such and such a date, and uh, I know what it is I want, and I'm going to be as clear as I can be about that, and that person will either meet my needs or not, and if not, I go to number two on the list. Right, and yeah, and, actually, and, uh, and I love this, how it does dovetail into the topic here, in that, you know, what, so massage, and how do I significate that, you know? And, and I'm obviously significating it that that is a real important part of my mental health and my mm -hmm. physical health. And, and for somebody else, that doesn't matter anything to them at all, particularly in those two areas. So again, it comes back to an individual power and responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, many of us certainly know deep down inside, but I can say to my, you know, just in what we've been speaking here today, how I don't consciously act on it. And yet my subconscious probably knows and will manifest it in ways that is going to force me to actually have to address it, which is in this case as a symptom of unwell, of being, of feeling unwell. Um, and that's yes, the way my subconscious is trying to. Yeah. Your subconscious is clearly telling you that you need this. Yeah. And various ways of, of, of uh, getting it at any given point in time. Uh, uh, I probably spend more time alone than I do doing anything else. Uh, and uh, I am very fortunate in that I uh, have a partner who enjoys cuddling with me when we go to bed. Uh, I also have a. Uh, uh, dog that likes to sit in my lap and uh, uh and i sometimes refer to the dog as my blanket uh, it, uh, uh but when i'm sitting alone and i'm feeling a little scared or a little uh, lonely or something of that sort i will cocoon myself i'll uh, sit in my most comfortable chair and i'll get a, uh, a blanket and wrap it around myself uh put a uh, something uh, for my head to uh, to rest on uh, and do everything I can to make myself as comfortable and feel as safe as possible. Mm. Uh, the, uh, 
sometimes you have somebody, sometimes you don't. Uh, the, the name of the game is what can I do right now that'll help me feel better? And it may just be schedule an appointment with somebody. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the beauty of, uh, uh, of massage therapy is that it's basically a contract as, as any form of therapy that is good is. Uh, you're basically saying I will spend X amount of time with somebody whose job it is to help me feel a little better. Mm, nice. Uh, and I think that's actually why I love our interaction in a sense. I get uh, that opportunity to experience myself in a much more positive way, whether it's through this podcast series or our previous interactions in a you know doctor client uh, relationship. Our topic again is the meaning of anything is what you give it. The meaning of life is what you give it. And it's so interesting. I've seen this question been popping up in, in a lot of my feed on social media, which again is sort of uh, an external validation that you know what we're talking about is also out there in the zeitgeist. Um, and my meaning for life is completely different than anyone else's because of how I significate it. And I was really triggered by what you just said that like, if you're feeling unsafe, you'll kind of try to, you know, put a nice blanket around your, any way to try to cocoon, if you will, as a way to try to make yourself safe. And I, uh, that made me just think of how I look at the world in a sense, in that same way that some people may look at, you know, life as, oh, a series of, un of unfortunate, disparate, unrelated events uh, that you just have to re react to and, you know, buckle down and knuckle under to. And, and that to me is a very frightening uh, way of looking at the world around me. And, and I, 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 choose to actually use your viewpoint a little bit more and, and to look at it a, a much more softly and welcoming and warming and, and safe, you know, because again, it goes back to what we were talking in our initial 10, my eyes are creating this reality around me. Um, and, and for me, I need it to be as rewarding and welcoming and safe and as positive as, as, as possible for my well-being and 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 to be able to go out into it yes a series of events which may or may not be random but the meaning that you give to those events uh, gives you an opportunity to learn from them and when you learn from those events in a way that allows you to grow rather than shrivel uh, you're giving meaning to your life uh, in, in a way which which works for you and that's all that really matters is finding a way that works for you. Uh, the only caution there is uh, making sure that the way that works for you does not hurt other people. Mm. Uh, because if you're looking for ways that work for you, you're basically looking at something that's going to help you. And if you can do that without it's being at the expense of others, or e even better, as, as my life is about, uh, helping others. Mm. Uh, the simple truth is that... Uh, that uh, the best validation a therapist can get is uh, a statement from the client, uh, uh, you've made me a better person. Mm. Uh, and of course, I don't make anybody anything, uh, but I give data, which hopefully, uh, and experiences, which hopefully help my clients to feel like they're better than they were before the talking to me. And, uh, and if the stories I tell help with that, uh, then I'm doing my job right. If they don't help so much, I'm seeing, I'll be happy to see anybody for nothing and talk to them about it. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and this sort of, you know, really rides into, you know, my recent past here and uh, my brush with death at the, you know, hand of a, uh, at my own hand and, and the barrel of a 38 revolver. And how do I significate that going forward in a way to try to be empowering and, and still live in a world that is safe for me. And I think what we've been doing, you know, since then, the work you and I've been doing and, and this podcast series as an, as an example uh, is, is just an example of it, you know, that uh, leading up to that event, this was missing 
Um, and it came to a head on that night. And since then, you know, been working really hard to, again, reframe my reality in a way that is loving and positive and supportive uh, of me and everyone that uh, my eyes have created and, and my, my amygdala interprets. Yeah, I think that the, uh, when, when someone goes through, and, it, and I consider it an honor to be able to talk to you uh, after you reached that extreme point, and it's not something that, uh, that the therapist gets many chances to do because most people who uh, point to 38 at their uh, heart and pull the trigger do not survive it. Mm. Uh, the, the key to getting beyond that is understanding what were the circumstances uh, that led you to that point where you saw no other option. And uh, the, the, from my point of view, the most important thing is what was going on in your head, what was going on in your father's head, uh, what led you to believe that that was the only possible option. Uh -huh. You said you talked about it in some of these uh, podcasts. Uh, at the same time, I think that the, the key to understanding it is to uh, not just find a way to positively connote it, but also to truly understand how bad it was because uh -huh. you won't get back to that point if you've been there and realize that the place that you reached was uh, one corner of one floor of a big building that was inside you. Mm -hmm. And it's so interesting as we talk about, you know, that so many have gone to the dark night of the soul not to return. And yet I have, and I'm really fortunate because I don't know if it was you, but somebody reframed this whole incident in a way that was so empowering for me that really gave me my life meaning. And it, and it ties directly in to our conversation here. And that was that they said that it was just that. You went to the dark night of the soul, many have not returned, and the hero story continues. And it was that last line that each of us are living the hero's life. Mm -hmm. yes. every day and that uh, is uh, I don't think they uh, whoever told you that those are not my words on the other hand I agree with them and so I want to you know give an uh, uh, an add a person to that individual the uh, we each describe to ourselves we each have an announcer in our heads describing to ourselves what's going on there's something that you were you yourself said there was something you were saying to yourself just before you pulled the trigger and it was something like the world would be better off without me right uh, everybody will now that was a, a uh, projected distortion which uh, uh, turned you into an anti-hero not a hero yeah. Uh, it certainly said, you know, I am, uh, I, I, there's an assumption that you are evil coming from that. And my experience is that uh, uh, evil, it, nobody really thinks of themselves as evil. Uh, everybody has a rationalization. Everybody has something they say to themselves to prove that they're not evil. Even Hitler, you know, has something he was saying to himself to believe that what he was doing was good, not bad. Uh, the uh, once a person understands that they're saying to themselves, it becomes clear that there's something else they could say to themselves that would turn them into uh, someone who's doing good instead of bad. Uh, but nobody goes at it saying, oh, I'm evil. I'm going to do evil stuff because it makes me feel better to do evil stuff. Uh, uh, the, uh, there, are, there are TV shows that, that create that, uh, uh, that narrative. And uh, I just laugh when I see them and turn it off because I see that the screenplay writer uh, didn't really understand how the mind works. The way the mind really works is that when the conscious and subconscious are in concert, uh, there is uh, an understanding of the fact that there's no part of you that is evil. 
there are only parts of you that can push you in the direction of doing something that's evil. Mm. And I love because shame is so wrapped up in this. And I know that this is going to be uh, the basis for our third part of this discussion. Again, we're in the second part of the discussion right now, which again is about thoughts, framing uh, perspective, which informs reality and impacts reality. But we'll get into shame uh, because that's definitely intertwined with this and what you just said as well. Our topic for today's discussion is the meaning anything has is what you give it. And by fiat, the meaning of life is what you give it, nothing more. It's that simple concept. Now you can go back in and say, oh, well, maybe it's this or that or anything. That's even going way too deep. It's just this very simple statement. The meaning of life is what you give it, done. And you can change the meaning of life and you can change the meaning of your life and you can change your happiness, your understanding of good and evil. You can change all of that just by looking at the process of your thinking and being open to the possibility that it isn't written in stone. Wonderful. Neil, your final thoughts on our topic. Uh, again, the meaning of life is what you give it. The meaning of anything is what you give it. It just continues on uh, our overall topic throughout the series uh, uh, of uh, your life is how you significate it. Yeah, I think that the, uh, the key to uh, any effectiveness that I have is that I'm not afraid of getting in depth. I'm not afraid of going as deep as you need to go to get to the actual inner dialogue that's going on between the parts of yourself, between the parts of myself. And understanding what a person is saying to themselves is the key to that. Uh, bringing the conscious and the subconscious together uh, with each of them understanding their function is the key to it. Uh, I think of an example. Uh, I had a 12-year-old uh, uh, boy referred to me many years ago who uh, had um, uh, was constantly running away from home. His parents clearly uh, uh, had created a good home for him, but he would run away from home. Nobody would know where he went. And he would come back and, uh, and he would be brought to therapists and the therapist would ask him questions and he wouldn't say where he had gone or anything like that, but he would always come back by himself and he was always a little happier when he came back. And uh, I got to talking to him and I spent uh, uh, half a dozen sessions with him and the whole goal of that was to get him to trust me. And when he did trust me, what I found out was that uh, he was running away from home and going to visit his grandfather uh, his grandfather had, in fact, uh, uh, been alienated from the rest of the family, and he would go to be to be with his grandfather. His grandfather, when he would have fun together and tell stories, but the one uh, message was, "Don't tell anybody that you came here." Uh, so, once the issue came out that uh, that the grandfather was involved, it became very easy uh, to resolve the problem, uh, meet with the parents, uh, get the grandfather in. Uh, but until I I figured out what was really going on in his head. What was he saying to himself? How was he positively connoting something that was freaking out his family, bringing the police into looking for him and all kinds of other stuff? Uh, yeah, you had to get past the external appearance of things uh, and inside the kid's mind in order to understand what's really going on. Getting in depth is to me always the key to understanding how people significate things and what meaning they're giving to their lives. Wonderful. We've been speaking with Dr. Neil Maranello, behavior expert, solutions-focused life coach out of Woodstock, Vermont, near six decades exploring the human condition. You can follow the good doctor on Twitter at Coach Dr. Neil, and we invite you to join us next time here on Good Mental Health, where our topic will be a continuation of today's uh, No Two People Think Alike. On behalf of the good doctor, I'm Matt Kelly, wishing you good mental health.